Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Jean Freeman on NHS performance. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Jean Freeman. Cabinet Secretary, please. <clears throat> thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. And thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Today, thanks in large part to Scotland's NHS, our people are living longer. That is good for all of us, it's good for our communities, and it is a testament to our health service. It does mean, however, increasing demand on our NHS. And that increased demand comes alongside the need to respond to medical advances, to effectively provide preventative care, and to address underlying health inequalities. These are not challenges that Scotland alone faces. They challenge healthcare systems across the world. But it does make it essential that we ensure our whole system has the capacity, coordination, and workforce to deliver the best care possible in every setting. <clears throat> we do so in an uncertain environment, not least the damage that Brexit will do to our health and care services. This improvement plan, which I'm publishing today, focuses on reducing the length of time people are waiting for key areas of health care. Simply put, some people are waiting too long to receive the care they need. As with the recent financial framework, this plan's investment is predicated on the assumption that the consequentials the UK government has promised will be delivered as a true net benefit to the Scottish budget. On that basis, the plan commits total investment of £535 million in resources and a further £121 million in capital over the next two and a half years to make a sustainable and significant step change in waiting times. This is in addition to the 200 million already being invested in our elective and diagnostic treatment centre programme. This increased investment will support reforms to increase capacity where it is needed, reduce the numbers of people experiencing long waits, reshape delivery to ensure sustainable performance against targets in the future, and achieve the necessary balance of care to support this. Over the next 30 months, we will deliver phased and decisive action with clear milestones to secure substantial and sustainable improvements to performance and significantly improve the experience of patients waiting to be seen or treated. By October 2019, 80% of outpatients will wait less than 12 weeks. 75% of inpatients and day cases eligible under the treatment time guarantee will wait less than 12 weeks to be treated and 95% of cancer patients will continue to be treated within the 31-day standard. By October 2020, 85% of outpatients, inpatients and day cases will wait less than 12 weeks. And by spring 2021, 95% of outpatients and 100% of inpatients and day cases will wait less than 12 weeks. And 95% of patients awaiting cancer treatment will be seen within the 62-day standard. In meeting these commitments, we will ensure that clinically urgent patients and those waiting longest are prioritised. Our focus is on both physical and mental health. So following our programme for government's £250 million package for mental health, the Mental Health Minister will come back to this Parliament later this year to set out the specific actions and targets to improve mental health performance. Achieving all of this requires work to address existing targets, but it also requires a whole system approach spanning hospital, primary, community and social care to really increase sustainable delivery. Solutions will differ across the country and across specialities, but the drive for improvement will be national in scope. It will require national action to increase capacity. This will build on our programme of investment in our new elective centres to provide additional capacity to meet additional demand and protect the scheduling of elective care from the pressures of unscheduled care. Through the improvement plan, we will accelerate delivery of the elective centre programme, including the operation of a new CT scanner at the Golden Jubilee coming on stream from 2019. The additional capital investment will include 17 million at Forth Valley Hospital, which will include putting two new theatres in operation 
and putting additional MRI capacity at the hospital by the middle of next year. This will be followed by elective centres in Highland, Grampian, Tayside and Lothian and a second expansion at the Golden Jubilee. And we will be looking to bring forward where we can the delivery dates on these important new centres. Working with the Scottish Access Collaborative, we will focus improvements on those clinical priorities where pressures are greatest. Across, across all specialties, we will improve productivity through a sustained application of state-of-the-art technologies. One example of how we can use technology to improve performance and the patient's experience is that by this November, we will launch a scale-up challenge to mainstream the Attend Anywhere video consulting platform. And work is also underway to accelerate how artificial intelligence and automation can reduce waiting times. But these actions alone will not be enough. We must develop new models of care that support more sustainable services and alleviate the demand on secondary care and reduce the pressures on services that come from increasing unscheduled care. Community and primary care services are playing an increasingly critical role in ensuring that patients can receive more timely care closer to home. Our commitment to changing the landscape of local health and care was reaffirmed in the recent joint statement with COSLA on health and social care integration. Over the next year, we're accelerating the whole system redesign of local patient pathways through integration authorities, NHS boards and clinicians. This will help shape the front door services of hospitals such as A&E, helping improve their performance and ensure everyone gets access to the most appropriate care in the right place. We're implementing the new general medical services contract and supporting the new primary care improvement plans. So local services can be redesigned to allow GPs extra time for appointments, requiring longer discussions and building multidisciplinary teams. At the same time, services will be improved through regional delivery and national boards plans so services can deliver improvements on a cross-boundary basis. The wider public discussion and engagement on these draft plans will enter a new phase next month. Presiding officer, we know this action requires a supported and skilled workforce. While NHS Scotland's workforce has grown for the past six consecutive years, there remain key staffing constraints. We're making significant investments in staffing. We already delivered a three-year pay deal for all Agenda for Change staff, providing consolidated pay increases of at least 9% over three years for all those earning up to £80,000. We're creating a, a 2,600 extra nurse and midwifery training places over this parliament and investing three million to train an additional 500 advanced nurse practitioners. The number of GP training places are increasing to 400 a year and we're investing over 23 million to increase the number of medical school places. And over this parliament, we are training 1,000 paramedics to work in the community helping to reduce pressure on A&E services. These are some of the workforce improvements we are taking and the improvement plan will build on these. We will invest four million over the next three years in domestic and international recruitment for GPs, nursing, midwifery and consultant specialties with the highest existing vacancy rates. And we will develop a fresh approach by focusing activity to help address priority specialty areas with global shortages in areas such as psychiatry and paediatrics. How we plan our workforce is crucial. Our safe staffing bill will introduce requirements to ensure the right level of staffing for the workload associated with patient need. And we are leading other UK nations by publishing a fully integrated health and social care workforce plan by the end of this year, setting out how we will ensure we have the right numbers of staff in the right place at the right time to provide person-centred, safe and effective care. Presiding officer, in acting to reduce current levels of waiting times in key areas of care, our responsibility is also to increase the sustainability of our health and social care system. The successful future of that system is predicated on targeted investment and sustainable reforms. Patient satisfaction is high 
Our NHS workforce is at a historically high level and investment in our NHS is at a record level. All of that is a strong foundation for our work and for the carefully phased targeted action this plan sets out. And alongside the over £850 million of additional investment over the next two and a half years, it is decisive action that will deliver results for patients and for our NHS. And I commend this plan to Parliament. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I've got about 20 minutes to allow members to ask their questions. I'd ask those members who want to ask questions, press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Miles Briggs, followed by Monica Lynn. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement and welcome uh, Monica Lennon as well to her position. Um, every MSP in this chamber will have constituents who will ask for their help when they're faced with cancelled operations or unacceptable waiting times. Here in Edinburgh, for example, what are my constituents with severe hip problems, was told in June he could be waiting until February next year just for an initial appointment with an orthopaedic consultant before he would be added to a waiting list. So we hope that this action does see progress. But the fact stands that the treatment time guarantee which SNP ministers legislated for in 2012 has never actually been met. So today SNP ministers in this statement are publicly accepting that they have failed to deliver on past promises made to Scottish patients. What is key, though, is that SNP ministers understand that delivering a sustainable workforce is critical to this. Today, the Cabinet Secretary states the intention to create an additional 2,600 extra nurses and midwifery training places. Again, the fact stands that in Scotland today, 2,812 nursing and midwifery posts are vacant, with 852 unfilled for more than three months, a 27% increase on last year alone and that more than 4,300 nurses actually left the service last year. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline what steps which are not included in this statement will look to address the growing workforce crisis we have in Scotland? And does the Cabinet Secretary understand that we need to stop the bleeding in our NHS before we put new blood into our NHS? And what will she outline for a workforce plan in the future which is actually fit for purpose? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Um, I thank uh, Mr Briggs for uh, his comments and his uh, question. Um, the action that I have outlined will indeed see progress and, I, and this chamber has my absolute commitment that I will make sure that it does that. That is why it is deliberately phased and targeted. The commitment that I outlined in terms of additional uh, nursing and midwifery places is a commitment that we have made as a government. However, as Mr Briggs will know, we annually look at the number of training places that we need to put in place across a range of areas in our uh, health workforce. And as we do that, we take into account a number of factors, including uh, expected retirals, uh, numbers of staff who wish to work part-time. Part uh, now we have to take into account uh, those that we will lose or not be able to recruit because of impending Brexit and a number of other factors, including additional commitments that we have made as a government, not least in the programme for government, particularly in respect to mental health and the use of nurses there. So we will look annually at that commitment and look to ensure whether or not at any one point, based on all that data that we have, we need to increase it year on year. Uh, and I, he has my assurance that that is what we will do. And the uh, decisions that we will make for the 1920 intake will, of course, uh, be advised to this parliament and to uh, the Health and uh, Sport Committee. Uh, I absolutely do understand the importance of our workforce. I value them above all else because without our uh, highly trained, specialised, but most importantly, committed workforce, then our NHS would not deliver the significant results that it does deliver, uh, notwithstanding all the challenges that it faces. I will say two more things. First of all, the challenges our NHS in Scotland face are challenges faced across the world. But we, in this United Kingdom, are the only government with a plan for workforce and to tackle those challenges. A number of plans starting before recess with our medium-term financial framework and working all the way through. We have a plan, we have a commitment, and I am determined that we will succeed. Monica Lennon. I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of her statement. Scottish Labour will always welcome any additional support for the NHS and it is desperately needed, Presiding Officer. 
Last week, an investigation by Scottish Labour revealed that since 2015, there had been one million stress-related sick days in our NHS. Staff are at breaking point because this government has mismanaged the NHS. All of us are grateful to the dedicated staff who work in our NHS, and they deserve better than this. And so do patients. This government gave patients a legal right to treatment within 12 weeks. However, that law has been broken 150,000 times. So let's get this straight. Is it the government's intention to keep on breaking its own law until 2021? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I thank Ms Lennon for her question, and I too welcome her to her new role. I look forward to our exchanges. Uh, I don't believe, actually, that it is either fair or accurate, or indeed particularly helpful, to our staff in the NHS to use hyperbole such as we've just heard. If we look at uh, our iMatters uh, survey, then undoubtedly there are pressures and strain in our health service. Our workforce absence is higher than we would wish it to be. But we also have, across all our boards, significant satisfaction from our staff in terms of their working conditions and their levels of involvement. They know, as I do, if we could perhaps finish, Ms Lennon, they know, as I do, that there are pressures and challenges to be addressed. And indeed, this workforce plan and this plan that we are looking at today is the product of work with those very staff themselves. So I don't accept the hyperbole that is too often used. I'm disappointed that Ms Lennon isn't congratulating me on not abandoning the targets, which I think was uh, a concern I certainly read about in this morning's press. I have no intention of abandoning our targets and every intention of meeting them. Thank you. I have 11 members and 11 minutes. That's a minute for question and answer if everybody's to get in. Can't say it more blunt, bluntly than that. So, Ms White, no doubt you'll set an example. Sandra White, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, workforce planning and staffing is paramount, has already been stated. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if she believes that the implications of a no-deal Brexit will affect our ability to attack the specialist staff needed to realise the plan as is set out today. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Of course it will, but actually the implication of any kind of deal in Brexit that does not involve uh, the customs union and other uh, freedom of movement arrangements will impact on our health service. It will impact on our health service because even at this stage uh, in the proceedings, we do not yet have from the UK government uh, agreement on mutual recognition of qualifications. And I need to point out to members that what that means is that we could lose staff just now who want to stay with us, but we have not yet reached that agreement at a UK level in terms of the existing qualifications they have. So, and, and the pilot programme for registration, where the UK government is not extending that to uh, families of healthcare workers, uh, is one that will also significantly uh, encourage people to feel that they are not welcome here. We have been very clear about the welcome in Scotland and indeed today uh, have offered with the Welsh Government to pilot a programme of registration support that includes families as well as healthcare workers. Thank you. Alison Johnson, followed by Alec Cole-Hamilton. Thank you. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement. Do any of the proposed changes to the current targets and indicators reflect Sir Harry Burns recommendations for a life course approach to help ensure a more preventative focus in our health system? And can the Cabinet Secretary assure the Chamber that the needs of children and young people within our pressurised healthcare system are adequately reflected in this plan? Cabinet Secretary. If I could thank, I thank Ms Johnston for uh, her question. If I could answer the, the second part of it first. Yes, I can give you the assurance that the needs of children and young people of, of all our population indeed is, are reflected in uh, this plan. In terms of the work of Sahari Burns, um, I mentioned in my statement the work of the uh, Access Collaborative uh, and one of the tasks that I uh, have given them is to consider uh, in some detail the work of uh, Sahari Burns in terms of how we take forward uh, the means by which we can determine uh, where our health service is successful and where improvement is needed. Uh, that should not, however, deflect us, and I am not allowing it to do so, from the work that we need to do to meet the targets that we currently are committed to as a government. 
Thank you. Alec Cole-Hamilton, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Given that the Government's own improvement plan suggests that this September we posted our worst ever performance against the waiting time guarantee, does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that the coolest aspect of this is that every one of the 31% of people who will have missed that target will have received a letter saying they would have um, been seen in 12 weeks? And does she agree with me that it's time to review the management of expectations in our patients so that we can be upfront with them from the outset? about just how long they'll have to wait. Cabinet Secretary. I, I thank you to Mr Cole Hamilton for his question. Um, I would not personally describe it as reviewing the management of expectations, but where I think there is a need for significant improvement is how our boards communicate with those who are seeking treatment in order to be as upfront with them about what uh, the board is able to do as we work our way through this plan and we will make sure that boards are reviewing uh, the communication that they give patients and also that they are consistently communicating uh, with individuals rather than having uh, patients having to get in touch with boards themselves to find out what might be going on. Thank you. Emma Harper followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary has mentioned the use of Attend Anywhere programme, which is being utilised in a number of areas, including in Wigtonshire and my South Scotland region, to allow virtual attendance for patients to speak with medical professionals. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out when this will be rolled out across Scotland and whether she believes this will reduce the need for a number of outpatient appointments? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank Ms Harper for that question. We uh, plan to commence the wider rollout of Attend Anywhere across the country in December this year. Um, it's being implemented in a way that is uh, specific to try and remove the need for some outpatient appointments uh, and to uh, alleviate pressure, particularly on uh, individual patients uh, who might otherwise need to travel uh, to uh, meet those appointments. There's clearly a need though, and the pilot programme has demonstrated to us that this is entirely clinically safe to do so, there is a need to ensure that you offer that opportunity to patients where it is clinically safe for them to do so. And it is on the basis of the success of the pilot programme that we will roll it out from uh, December. Thank you, Brian Whittle, followed by Alistair Allen. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Uh, the Health and Sport Committee report that the government has made uh, limited progress in reporting budget allocation against the nine national health and wellbeing outcomes. One of the Cabinet Secretary agrees with the committee that there needs to be a greater link made between investment and delivering quality health outcomes, and if so, how does she intend to redress the lack of transparency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I do, I thank Mr Whittle for uh, that question. I do agree that there needs to be uh, greater clarity in terms of our investment and where it goes and how that links to those uh, quality health outcomes and indeed to our overall approach of safe, effective and person-centred care. And particularly with respect to this plan, uh, we will make sure that uh, members understand how that investment is got the additional investment uh, that I outlined earlier is going to be used to deliver the actions of that plan. We are currently reviewing uh, how we uh, uh, deal with these matters and I would hope to be able to come back to the Health and Sport Committee and respond to some of the issues they raised in that regard. Alistair Allen, followed by David Stewart. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of certain press reports today that uh, a range of targets would now be getting withdrawn. Given her comments today, what will the Cabinet Secretary be doing to reassure patients and staff that she has no such plans? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you um, for the question. Um, I'll be saying it loudly and clearly, starting here. I have no intention of withdrawing the targets and every intention of meeting them. I will say that here in this chamber. I will repeat it in any uh, media commentary. And indeed, it is very clear in the news release that we have issued. The plan itself speaks to that. We have no intention of withdrawing from the targets that we have set and we intend to meet. David Stewart, followed by John Meese. Uh, President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that well-respected economist Professor John McLaren has concluded that the NHS will face an annual black hole of up to £400 million, rising to £415 million a year in 2023. Is there anything in this afternoon's statement that would fundamentally change the above analysis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me say, start by saying that I fundamentally disagree with the above analysis. And let me give uh, Mr Stewart, thank you to him for his question, uh, some of the reasons why I do so. I'll be brief, presiding officer, and I'm happy to follow up in greater detail. Mr McLaren's reference point is a publication in May. 
It's a publication that makes uh, various assumptions about what a modernised NHS would look like. Uh, a comparable figure in the financial framework is 3.5%. That is a figure that is supported by the King's Fund, the Nuffield Trust, the Health Foundation. It is entirely consistent with the majority of independent uh, analysts and indeed uh, uh, is based on uh, anticipated demographic pressures greater than those included in uh, Mr McLaren's uh, assessment. So I disagree with his assessment and I believe our financial medium-term financial framework that I set out before recess sets out very clearly the challenges, what we are doing to meet those challenges and the further work that is required in that regard. John Mason followed by Annie Wells. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Golden Jubilee Hospital twice in her statement. I wonder if she can say any more about the investment there and what increased capacity there will be. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and thank you uh, to um, Mr Mason for uh, that question. Uh, specifically, uh, the increased capacity in Golden Jubilee from March 2019, an additional CT scanner which will provide additional 10,500 images per year, Throughput of cataract, oper cataract operations undertaken in the mobile theatre will be increased to provide another 600 cataract operations and additional 600 endoscopies between uh, last month and March uh, 2019 and an additional uh, 1,200 for the financial year 2019-20. Uh, additional general surgery activity providing 250 more procedures and an additional 4,000 ultrasound scans uh, per year from 1920. In addition, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that Forth Valley and uh, Golden Jubilee uh, have uh, undertaken uh, at least two, to my knowledge, shared appointments in terms of ophthalm ophthalmology consultants, uh, which is an example of working across boundaries and indeed working in a new uh, manner, better fitted to the needs of our patients. Thank you. If everyone can be brief, I'll get the last three questioners in. Annie Wells, followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The percentage of medicine places accounted for by Scottish domiciled students has fallen to its lowest level in 10 years under the SNP at just over 50%. Is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied with this drop? And can she tell me how many of the additional 400 GP training places, as promised in the statement, will be for bright young Scots from all walks of life? Cabinet Secretary. Well, those are additional training places that the Scottish Government will fund uh, and therefore those who uh, uh, fall within the eligibility of that funding uh, will receive uh, those places provided they meet the requirements of the medical uh, schools. In addition though, since we're on the subject of uh, additional medical training, uh, I didn't mention and I should have done uh, the Scott Gem programme which is a postgraduate programme just begun uh, over in the uh, universities of Dundee and St Andrews, uh, which uh, offers specific training uh, targeted at GP work in remote and rural communities. And as an additional measure, which has 55 students on it currently, and if it proves successful, would be one that we would want to uh, not only continue, but increase in size, and will target specifically those areas in terms of GP where we have particular shortfalls. Mary Fee, followed by Stuart McMillan, briefly, please. We know the impact that delayed discharge has. 43,913 bed days were lost in August. There's been a 15% increase in the number of patients whose discharge has been delayed due to issues with their health and social care package. Integrated joint boards... No, no, were, that's not briefly. Just get to your question, please. Integrated joint boards were set up to reduce delayed discharge. Can the Cabinet Secretary give the Chamber a realistic date when this might actually happen? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have a number of, of joint boards, of course, as, as um, the member knows, and providing a realistic date that encompasses them, encompasses them all uh, actually removes their capacity to meet local demand, which is why they're there in the first place. And w I probably would be accused at that point of central dick tax, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, but what I am going to say to the member is that if she, I'm sure she did pay careful attention to what I said, I talked about whole system reform and I also talked about the, the critical importance of increasing the pace, I've been doing that since June of this year, increasing the pace on integrated health and social care in order to ensure that we alleviate the pressures in our secondary and tertiary care system and we are working on that but we're doing that in consultation as is appropriate 
and jointly with local authorities. I would have thought that is an approach that members, certainly on those benches, claim to uh, want us to do and would be one that they would applaud. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary indicate what steps have been taken to update uh, ophthalmic services so that more can be done in the community rather than in acute settings? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. <coughs> yes, there are a number of steps that have been undertaken in terms of ophthalmic uh, services. Uh, we now have uh, a range of uh, opportunities that uh, suitably qualified uh, and clinically approved uh, opt opt opticians and optometrists can undertake, specifically in uh, longer term uh, eye uh, care issues, in the longer term maintenance support uh, with, for those with um, macular um, uh, disorders uh, and for other eye conditions and we're looking to continue not only to continue that but to roll that out because that is part of the primary care development plans that each of those integrated joint boards have now submitted. Thank you. Managed to get everybody in, but I have to say we took a little time out of the next debate because there was time in hand. So you've still got to get tighter with your questions. Uh, thank you very much. That ends questions on the statement and we'll move on to the next item of business in a moment.